So we have to do it Monday or Wednesday to put them off. Figure it out. Okay. Thank so you. first, no. let me give you the lab brief that I promised. So there's two different ones I'll explain. Um, same concept, but and I'll give you some ideas. You can actually use these with clients. I use these with clients quite a bit. So the labyrinth is a meditative or contemplative tool. It's really good for quieting your mind. It's really good for getting messages from guidance or connecting with higher beings. Um, it has its roots. They don't really know. They just know that every single culture has a concept of the labyrinth. Um, like the Native Americans have what's called um, the man in the basket or the man weaving the basket, something like that's another one. It's square, kind of tilted. Um, the more intricate one is the most famous one. It's called the Chartres Labyrinth. It's at the Chartres Cathedral. <coughs> they actually discovered it. It used to be used very early on um, in the church, and then they covered it up. And now it's actually being um, used again. And you can actually go to France um, and and walk the, the charts. They have pilgrimages and stuff in there. There are labyrinths all over the world. If you're interested, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it, there's a website. It's called labyrinthlocator.com. And you can type in the zip code or the city, and you can find labyrinths all over. So I built one in my backyard. I'm going to be rebuild, rebuilding it soon because the rope is, is getting destroyed with the lawn mowing. But people make them out of stone, people make them in the sand, people make them everywhere. And some of these labyrinth locator people, it's homes, and they open their homes and you can go and walk home. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful experience. In Delray Beach, the Duncan Center has two. They have a walk every Monday, I want to say it's the first Monday of every, of every month. Um, it's beautiful. It's a black marble labyrinth inside, um, and then they have one outside. So most of them are outside that you can just show up. So one of the things that I've started doing with my family is that anytime we're going to go on a trip, we make a point to walk two or three labyrinths. Um, if we're driving somewhere, we stop along the way. If we're like we were in uh, New York and Pennsylvania for Thanksgiving, we walk four labyrinths together. And what happens is the labyrinth is not a maze. The labyrinth only has one entrance in and one entrance out just like your spiritual journey. And it's representative of that. The center is said to be called God, or your soul, or your Atman, or your guides, whatever it is that nomenclature that you use, but that's the concept. So a lot of times people will set an intention as they walk. Oftentimes there'll be labyrinth walks. I do some at my house, so I'll invite you, I'll send you guys the email if you're interested. And we'll set a theme for the night. Um, so you walk in, but what I was telling you yesterday is if you trace your finger, and a lot of people that are in wheelchairs that come to labyrinth walks, they can't obviously walk the labyrinth. So they're given paper labyrinths, and you can give it to your client. If they're at their desk and they need something to concentrate or contemplate for five minutes, they can take this, they even do it on their phone, and you can take your finger, and that single points the mind. It gets it focused so they can continue in their day. So it's something that you can have handy. They have them in sand. They have, I don't know if they have apps. I haven't looked. Um, but you can bring up an image and you can do it and it helps to concentrate you. And then on the way out, it is supposed to be like your return, like your answer of what you asked, if you asked a question or if you asked to set an intention. Um, and people will document that they get answers on the path they get clarity, they meet up with loved ones. So there's been a lot of different um, accounts. Um, there's a woman, her name is Lauren Artress, and she revived the labyrinth. She's the reason that that labyrinth has been re revived. And there's a, a society, it's called the Veritas Society, they're out of San Francisco, that she runs, and they do labyrinth walks in, in classes all around the globe. There's one in Scotland that I was telling you yesterday that I wanted to go in August. Um, it's a good time to go to in August because it's warmer. Okay, yeah, it's, it's like August, amazing. So. It's in Iona. Oh my God, the <laughs> Iona? <laughs> yes, so it's, it's a pilgrimage of all these old oh, places so in Iona, and it's all in Iona. It depends. 
Depends on how big. Like the shark's labyrinth is very intricate, intricate, so it takes longer. But it depends on how big they are. Sometimes they're huge. I've walked ones that it takes 30 minutes. And then I have others that have to walk three minutes. Now you can do whatever you want on the labyrinth. If you feel like laying down on the labyrinth, if you feel like picking up a flower on the labyrinth, I usually set an intention or ask something. Sometimes if I don't have anything present in my mind, I will be like, show me what I need to know. Um, and last, I think the last labyrinth I walked, I was walking and I said that. And then on the path I saw in a place that there was absolutely no flowers, nothing grew there, there was this tiny little flower. So then you interpret the message that you're given. Like this is given to you from, from your own soul, from your own. So uh, different people use it in different ways. But if you trace it, what I was telling you yesterday is when you walk in first, you're really close to the center. So it feels like you're really close to the center. And then as you get outward to the out, outer labrises, those are called labrises, or circuits are the circle, the labrises are what look like the black parts in between. So as you get out to the further circuits, it looks like you're further from the center, but really you're actually closer. And if you use this as an idea of your spiritual path, think of those times. It reminds me always of that footsteps um, uh, prayer. Oh, yeah. That when you think there's only one set of footsteps and Jesus, or I think it was Jesus, said that's when I was carrying you. And it's like when we think we're further out, that's when we're actually closer. Because that's when we're in the depths, in the depths, depths, depths of the stuff that's happening to us. And that's where I call alchemy happening. That's when you're being purified. You're being purified by the fire of your life because you have to. And that happens, according to astrology, every seven years. So we think that when we're furthest from our path, and I hear this all the time, I want to get back on my path. It's impossible to be off of your path because you are the spirit. The spirit, the Atman, is never changing. The spirit is the spirit. It's us. It's the ego. It's the mind that makes us think we are. And so this tool is a really good representation of how when we think we're furthest, we're actually getting closer. So there's a lot to do with the labyrinth. Um, you can actually write a poem in it, you know, to follow the circuits. It's really easy um, to do, especially the seven circuit one, the simpler one. Now, if you look at the the Schartz one, it is believed to be the brain, the four parts of the brain, the four lobes of the brain. So what happens is when we cross over, which is one of the reasons why in yoga we're constantly, and we'll talk about the nadis, why we're constantly doing twists to connect right and left, is so that we can create balance. Same thing. So I have used the labyrinth in my work where I actually have very like logical left brain people and I have them intentionally, when they walk into the right side of the labyrinth, start to shift the perspective because it's like, okay, now you're in the, you're in the creative part. Let's take that idea. It's the same thing about shifting perspective, moving the seats or the activities we saw yesterday with the woman. So there's so much that, that you can do. But it's a wonderful contemplative tool to just kind of walk with your finger. If that's all your client can do. It's something simple and it can really get them to center, get them grounded. So I recommend that. But if you can look at labyrinthlocator.com, there's one right here in Miami Lakes. I was talking about it a few weeks ago, how I went one day and I was an absolute mess and I met an eye and I start crying and I'm like, I can't find the entry down. It's exactly where I was in my state of mind. And so they say that the labyrinth will speak to you exactly where you are. And that's how I felt that day. And I said to him, this is exactly how I feel. Like I can't see where to get into the situation. And I could not find the entrance to the labyrinth. I'm sure if today I go, it's a completely different <laughs> labyrinth. You know, so it's interesting how every experience is very different. And that's because we're constantly changing. We're never the same person. Gurdjieff, I mentioned him yesterday. He's one of my absolute favorite, favorite philosophers. Um, he has the concept of the many eyes. He says that we're, just like we're talking about the many minds, we talk about one eye, but he says that we're like million, 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 million eyes, because at no moment are we ever the same person. Right. 
It's a constant, if we know that every thought is different, then every moment we're a different individual. And our point is to remember, you know, really that we're that divine child of God. Um, so the labyrinth can speak to you. You can do that every single day and get a different experience. And you can set an intention. You can pray in the center. I sometimes will do activities in the center. Um, but it's a really beautiful, beautiful tool. And there's also a labyrinth society. They have an annual meeting. This year it's in Houston. Um, and if you join their Facebook page, they have amazing pictures of amazing like, labyrinths that people build out of leaves, out of pumpkins, out of candles. I mean, just beautiful. It's a really beautiful tool. Um, and it's in every culture. Every culture has a version of it. Um, in Taos, New Mexico, there's this beautiful Native American village, and they have a walk every year. Um, it starts like with a dirt road and it like leads you to the labyrinth. It's like a, a pilgrimage um, and you can build it. It's super easy. If you're ever at the beach, you can build a simple labyrinth. Um, you may have four dots and you just connect. Hold on. <laughs> I show my husband all the time. Um, <laughs> Four dots. I can get it for you. I have a book. But it's something like that, where you connect the four dots. I just can't remember right now. And that's how we build the one in our house. But if you're interested, I can get it for you. It's very easy. But you can do that when you're in the beach, in the sand, that you may not have one. You can, uh, you can create it. Um, they do a bunch of building labyrinths um, in Houston. They're like all over the place where they take kids and they teach them in impoverished society, like communities how to build labyrinths. Um, and that same society will take children. They just did one in France um, where they went and they found sacred, uh, sacred property and they teach the children how to bless the land, how to douse it with the pendulum and then build it, and then do a ceremony, and then they leave something beautiful for the society, for that community. So it's a really, it's a huge renovation that this woman, Lauren Archer, has really revived. Um, and it's not just Christian, but a lot of churches, you'll see on that Labyrinth Locator, have them, because they realize that it's just like a renovation. In the they have one, I think. Yes, and, um, that's the one that That I church on 154th and 67th. Yes. It's all yeah, stone. It's stone, stone. Yeah. Back. I, I was wondering if it was a little bit of a one way, but now that you say that, you're yeah, right. It's it is, because it's one way in yeah. and one way out. Okay. So, and in the middle, it has a beautiful little like gazebo with mm -hmm. angels and stones. So, it's a really nice, um, a nice tool. It's something simple that you can incorporate in your own practice or give to clients. So, I absolutely love it. When you go to Scotland, make sure you go to the fifth one. Oh, I get her emails every week. You have to go to Pink Oh my gosh. Have you been? I haven't, but I, I mean, I, I love, I, I get I lean to weekly guidance. <laughs> I lean to weekly guidance from Finhorn every week in my inbox. Yeah. I want to go. Are you That's going? so beautiful. Yes. I was going to go, and then with the cancer, and then I was going to go to India, and then I decided to stay home. So I don't really know what I'm doing, but eventually yeah. I have to go to Scotland. Yeah. 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 Uh, the Celts. Yeah. Next year, absolutely. That's my next pilgrimage. Yeah, yeah, I don't go on vacations anymore. Right? Pilgrimages, absolutely. And we're just reconnecting in these pilgrimages with parts of ourselves. We're picking up, yeah. you know. And that really helps with the self-acceptance of, of who we are. Because even though we're, we're all witches, there's still a whole world out there that doesn't think this way. And we're in Miami. So right. we're like, it's easy. You go to meet up. Or you go to any of these spiritual stores and there's everybody doing Reiki and everybody with the tarot and the this and the meditation circles and full moon. But you go to a small town. My in-laws are from small town Pennsylvania. And my my mother-in-law was yesterday was telling me that she met this lady from another small town. And she's like, the woman is like, oh my God, you know, I can't tell anybody about this because I'll think I'm crazy. Oh, so... Oh, I saw the rain. I didn't remember. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Non-stop. Thank you, Ash. So, um, so it's nice when you're like going to these places to kind of, you know, reconnect with absolutely past yeah, parts. So we'll talk about that. So any questions about yesterday? Are we clear that the mind is one? Are we clear yes. that we have to have a philosophy of life? Very important. And I would recommend that as you are on this journey, and of course for clients, is that you kind of encourage them to write those things down. I was telling you yesterday that I do a client's this rule book. That we have to have what we say, what we think, what we do, it all has to be in harmony in order to really have health according to the definition of health from my perspective. Okay. The mind is only one, and we've got what are the four parts? Um, constant moving. Um, well, those are the qualities. Oh, so what are the four parts of the mind? If it's all one, but if we're going to break it up into a piece of inner, outer, okay. okay. Inner, uh, chitta, manas. So manas is which one? Outer, outer. outer. Chitta so is the manas we have the outer mind, and which mind. connects us to what? Or is guided the by the senses. Mm -hmm. And then we have the intermediate. Moody. 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 And then it's mainly intellect. 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 intellect and discrimination. What's the other part of the outer line? Ahamkar. The ego. And I want to talk a little bit about that for a second. Um, and then the inner mind is? Chitta. Chitta. Okay, the chitta. And that's when the soul goes inward. And how many parts does that have? It has five oh, parts, and we'll talk about those today. So I just want to talk a little bit about, I can tell that all the witches want to hear the esoteric good stuff that I love to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is the whole story? I think so. Can you check? I don't remember. My memory. <laughs> I'm constantly Anu Parama, and I'm like never in the Jagra. Like, it's like let's get back to even though we don't want to be there. Too. Is it red? There's a red dot. Okay, yeah. and is the microphone on? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's green. green. The light's green. Yeah. Okay, it's so cute. Oh, I love it. I love so, what is the story of Jesus all about? <clears throat> this is not about religion. This is, I'm starting with that because it's the one that everyone kind of knows, so you can understand it from the ego perspective and from the tantra perspective. It's about realizing that we are all God. But what about the death? Oh. What's the whole crucifixion, which is like the whole thing? Jesus died on the cross for your sins. Mm -hmm. What's that all about? Because we know that the Bible is a metaphysical story, mm -hmm. just like this beautiful book that Diana brought today. All of these texts are hidden language because as we were talking about yesterday the church didn't really want to <coughs> so they were holding the information that's why in Kabbalah is you had to be a man in 40 years old in order to be able to discover the secrets of Kabbalah that you go crazy and now here we are in the age of Aquarius and everybody has it accessible did everyone get the books I sent you yesterday yes, yes. thank you okay. so the story, when we talk about the crucifixion, what happened? What's that about? He was crucified because of his beliefs, and, and he was he accepted everyone and all. And, um, and then basically, they didn't like the way he was like riding the people up. That's what it was, making people like understand that hey, you know, we need to love each other. And, they didn't like that. So, okay. so the, the, the lesson or the teaching of compassion and love that we're all alike or we're all one. And then what happened? He dies and what happens two days later? The resurrection. The resurrection. Okay. So what does that mean metaphysically? What I want all of us to understand and what's so, so important is we cannot take these stories or these myths because they're just all myths at face value. We have to look at the deeper meaning. And every single religion and every single myth and every single story has the same lesson in it. They just picked different names and different wardrobes to dress it up for their people. 
So what's the story of the resurrection? What does it relate to with what we learned yesterday? That we have there's not just death. Death isn't the end. So every every self can be reawakened with spirit. Okay. Yes. That, so that the premise is that really death doesn't exist. Exactly. Right? The death of the body exists. Yes. But not the soul. The soul cannot die. We are Purusha. If that created every single thing here, that can never ever die. Now, what is the ego's role in the mind? What did we say is the main thing of the ego? Separation. It's an I like. Yeah. To separate you, to, to protect from, you, from, and to create this I, like, I have to save myself. So the ego's main function is to keep you from dying. And I'm not talking a physical death. It is physical, but we don't really understand. Of course, we have to protect ourselves so that I don't die, so I don't have a poison, so that someone doesn't come and stab me, and I run, I see danger. That's the function of the ego, the healthy function. But we have distorted it to an extreme. And what we do is, is everyone familiar with the Freudian term defense mechanism? Mm -hmm. Have you heard of defense mechanism? Yes. Okay, when we say, oh, that's just a defense mechanism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Defense mechanism is Biofly. rationalization, mm -hmm. justification. When we get into these defense mechanisms, what we're doing, we're purely in ego. Right. Because people will often ask me, well, how do I know when my ego is functioning correctly versus when it's not? And if you remember that the function of the ego is to simply keep us alive, if it is not to simply really protect you, everything else is wrongly used ego. That is the quote unquote bad ego. That's when you will hear yourself justifying what you're saying, what you're doing, what you're <clears throat> thinking, rationalizing it, going into like perfection. So the minute you catch yourself in that train of thought, the quote unquote bad ego has taken you over. So why, if the function of the ego is to keep you alive, does it have to justify that you're not wrong, or that you're better than your boss, or that, you know, oh, I didn't mean to do that, or I'm a good person. These are all the ego in its negative function, not what it's intended. So the ego, if the ego's point is to keep itself alive, it is going to do everything in its power for you not to kill it. So any moment that you are closer to another person, that you separate the connectedness of you, the ego has won. The ego has won the fight. That's the devil in the Bible. And what did Jesus try to preach? Kill the ego. We're all the same. We're of the same thing. And so they kill him, and he resurrects. Because every single time we are going through a difficult time in our life, or at every moment that we grow, we have killed the ego. So we are constantly in a cycle of death and rebirth. Death and rebirth. That's the whole story of Jesus. In, that story was stolen, by the way, from an ancient Sumerian myth called Ignana. I-N-A-N-N-A. -N -N -A. In mythology, Greek mythology, it's called Pluto. Every single religion, every single mythology has that same story because it's the basis of why we are here. Tantra talks about why is an orgasm a small death? If you've ever read that, orgasm is considered a small death. When you are united with that other person, there is a, a death. It's much deeper. It's a beautiful study. But you're breaking that sort of I-ness, and we are uniting as one. So every single time that you allow yourself to be compassionate, 
or you get closer to a human being, or you allow someone to enter and vulnerable in the, in the heart. That's why Hanuman, Hanuman is my, oh, my love. Okay, Hanuman, if you want something to concentrate on, to, to help your mind, concentrate on Hanuman. Lula Chalisa on Tuesdays. Oh my God, I have to do that every Tuesdays. morning. Go listen to it, because I can't remember. It's hard to see, but Hanuman's the monkey guy. Oh, they have them on my phone. Okay. okay, so when you have clients that have that, a lot of difficulty with the mind, send them to meditate on Hanuman or listen to Hanuman Chalisa, because that really is the strength of mind. <laughs> Hanuman had powers where he can turn himself big, he can turn himself small. It was all the power of the mind. He's amazing. He's the okay. perfect devotee. And his heart is open. And you see Jesus' a sacred heart. When we allow ourselves to get close to the other person, to stop defending ourselves, to stop thinking that we're better, we have honored our spirit. We have been able to bypass that ego. And so when we understand that all our life, all we are doing is having a series of death and rebirth, death, that's the only reason we are here. So it, it's at the microcosm is when you get sick, you're having a small death, whether it's a cold or whether it's a major flu that knocks you out, whether it's cancer, no matter what disease, you're having a small death. So that's a killing of the ego. That's why Jesus was saying last month that every time he gets sick, he realizes that he's growing from that illness because the body is processing whatever it has learned. So there's been a small death in that respect. And when we die, we leave this body and we take on another body. So it's just a series of death and rebirth, death and rebirth. And every single time that you're having a hard time, the hardest time of my life, that is your biggest growth lesson because you're literally becoming Jesus. You're dying and resurrecting and read the story of Ignana, it's a beautiful story. It's the whole thing, and I'll tell you a little bit about it, of this constant death and rebirth. And so the ego, its sole purpose is to keep you from, from, from dying. It does not want to die. Because it understands that part of our mind that if you grow, the ego gets dead. Because the minute you don't have to incarnate once again in a body, there's no more ego. He's screwed. So we have a whole part of ourselves that we have distorted its function that's just supposed to keep us alive when there's danger. The lions come and run. That we have now used as our coraza. How do you say that? Like our shield. Our, our armor. This is who I am. Hence the personality. So this ego is this thing that we have to be vigilant of. Because it wants to keep us from dying. But unless you die, you cannot resurrect. In the sense of the word of your little bit of growth in this lifetime, or in the larger sense, which we'll get to in a moment, we talk about the bodies, so that we can stop coming back. So when you hear yourself justifying, when you hear yourself rationalizing, oh, well, I had to do that, because imagine, right there, that's your ego. So you can identify it, because people have difficulty identifying it. This week. I had a huge fight with my ego, and I was fighting with my ego. The ego was winning. And finally, it was like, okay, you got it. So as long as we can recognize it, we're already in the world <coughs> process. It's a constant, constant battle. And that's the whole story of Jesus. Die so you can be reborn into your new self, into your real self, into the part of you that never dies, which is the Atma. But I really wanted to like emphasize that because sometimes to have difficulty, people have difficulty recognizing when their ego is in action. So when you find yourself in that justification, because those justifications or defense mechanisms, rationalization and so forth, keep you separate from the other. And anything that keeps you separate from the other really keeps you just separate from your true self. Okay. Any questions on that? And then, you have this one? I wish I did. I have I have the Yolanda by this artist. I have a little one in my car and a, a one on my two on my altar. Oh. Is that a beautiful sculpture? He is just perfect. So that's Rama and Sita. He just would do absolutely anything. And there you see the importance of, of the heart. 
that when we work in the heart, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the chakras, but the chakras are simply a division of our lower nature as animal and our higher nature as man. And in astrology, it's represented by the centaur, the half animal, half man. That's why in astrology, that's a very, very, very important. It's called an asteroid, but most people do not work with that in the chart because people just don't get it. But we can talk about that when we do astrology. Um, okay, so we left off with the different types of chitta. Okay, so I love this. So first I want to clarify the language because you're going to read in many places, and I read a little bit of to you yesterday, where chitta is consciousness. Okay, and you will read this, and this is where people get confused. They think it's consciousness. Oh, it's my consciousness, therefore this is my true self, and it's not. But different places will use that word, and that is the, the definition of it, so it can get confusing. This is still part of the mind, okay? But this is where we start doing the inner work, okay? So there's five types. The first type is Jagrat. And this is the conscious waking mind, okay? So this is what we would call the conscious. This is most people live at this level of consciousness. So when I was studying astrology, my smart ass astrology teacher used to say that this was nivel piedra, rock, a level of rock. This is when you're a rock. Most of us are just sitting there, rocks. So I'll say that, then he moved on to say then we go to level of water, then we go to level of wine, and then we go to level of blood. So as we evolve. So there's different things you'll, you'll hear about. But in Ayurveda, we talk about Jagrat Chitta. This is the consciousness that most people are at. If you think of the visualization, that's why I brought it up of the rock, most people are just there. Gurdjieff talks about it that we're machines, that we're just machines. We're automatic, we're mechanical men is what he calls it. We're on autopilot, okay? And all of these parts of chitta is autopilot. We just have layers of them. So we're a very complex sort of being. <coughs> and so this is where most of us function. This is what we would call in Western psychology the conscious mind, okay? That's it. Next we have samskara chitta. Okay, this is called the subconscious mind. This is where the impressions are held. Now this is, if you draw it like Freud said, the mind is like an iceberg, and this is the conscious, and everything else below the surface. The next four are the things we don't really remember, but these rule our life, okay? These rule our life. So, what's a samskara? You have a question? No. What's a samskara? It's an impression of past experiences, past lives. Yes. That remain, that remain that in your still, aura field. They remain imprinted right. on your energy body. When I do an energy healing, my, my particular gift is very clairvoyant, and I use my hands as my eyes. I close my eyes. I can read your aura, your energy field, with my palm. And I can see all of this, and everybody can learn this very easy, I'll teach you all. Not so. Because <gasps> her cute little face. <laughs> her cute little face. <laughs> the samskaras are there. It's just like if I were to take, and many of you have scars from the surgeries, or it's the same thing. The thing is that these things are brought from lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. And honey, it takes so much Clorox and a big scrub brush to scrub that sucker. That is why we're just given this one little thing to work on in this incarnation. Because you're going to be there for all 90 years with your little Ajax and Clorox scrub brush trying to this one thing. So these samskaras are really, really deep. Now how is this subconscious created? Do you have a question? No, I was just was going to ask you something. I can ask you. Okay. How is the subconscious created? This I find to be the most fascinating thing. How is the subconscious created? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. <laughs> yeah. Okay. When your mother and 
father conceive you, at that moment of conception, this is what we call the manas prakriti. Okay, this is how your mind is created. Okay, it's it's phenomenal. Okay, you're out there hanging out, deciding to come into a little body. You see these two poor souls that are so lost because you're out of your body at this point, so you can see all their crap. <laughs> and you've decided. Every single one of us has decided that those are the crappy people <laughs> that we want. Yeah. Oh, gee, those two people have all the crap that I need to work on. God, I found my people. I found my people. Them. They're going to be the ones that are going to help me. And so we choose these parents. At that moment of conception, your parents have a certain amount of sattva, a certain amount of rajas, and a certain amount of tamas. Okay, those are the mental gunas. Okay. That combination of your parents' mental gunas creates your mind. So you incarnate, you're screwed. <laughs> Now think of it. Most of us are not planned, a drunken night. Think of the mental state of your parents. At 18, at 24. Mine was 16. Who the hell knows what they were thinking? They sure as hell weren't homing and thinking about, oh my ego. They were purely in the flesh and the senses. And from <laughs> that, you were born. And that is what every single one of us is battling with for the rest of our life. How did your mother create your physical body? I don't know, I'm gonna ask her a little. <laughs> <laughs> no, from her food. It's the mother's nutrition that creates the physical body. But it is the nutrition, the ojas, of your parents that create your subtle bodies and that creates your your mind. So I had a really neat experience to really understand this. When I was going through my whole cancer thing, I call my connection my guides. My guides show me this whiteboard. Have you ever heard of the saying, what you think of me is none of my business? Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. What? It's not none of my business. It's none of my business. Your business. Right, because that's your idea of right. me. That's your own projection. Because all the mind does is project. That's why when you hate someone, it's all about you. <laughs> so I see this message, and it says, what your mom or father thought of you was none of your business. Every single one of us, the demon, the ego, call it what you will, that you're the beast that you're fighting with on that day-to-day -day business, that day-to-day uh, the day to day basis, at that moment of conception, when you are conceived, your Ayurveda says month three. That's why that first sort of trimester is, is hard, so to speak. But the actual chitta, the actual subconscious, is created at that moment. At that moment, the best of your mother and the best of your father is all in. 20 years pass, 40 years pass. Oh, but my mom and I have such a great relationship and we travel the world together and we have lunch every Tuesday and we get along so great and she's evolved and I've evolved and you are still two years old or one minute old and still thinking that your mother is the same person that conceived you because that's what makes you up. So we are fighting with demons that no longer exist. But the subconscious, this is the screwy thing of the subconscious, has no time. It does not know that you are 36. It does not know that I'm 43. It still thinks that I'm in that womb and that my parents are 19 with the little stupid pebble brain of theirs and that's what I was created. And so I am constantly, constantly fighting and wanting to have a temper tantrum, my ego, saying, I want this and I want that. 
because I'm simply reacting to, and that's only one layer. Then you have to have all the some scars from all your other past lives, from all your other parents, from all your other traumas, from all the other egos. How do we beat this thing? It owns us. So at that moment, the best of your parents and the worst of your parents is you. And what did I tell you yesterday about the ego? What does the ego only want to see? What it wants you to see? The good. So you only want to see the good of your parents, the, which now is you, because that thought, that mind, that conception created your mind. So not only are you in refusal to see the bad, because we're all children. Nobody wants to see the bad of mommy and daddy. None of us. Even if you know your mother is a manipulative liar, you do not want to see that. You justify. Why? Because then you're a manipulative liar. Because that thing created you. This is hard. This is the work of looking at yourself and saying, damn, I'm a manipulative liar. And we all are. We, every single one of us has these things. And it goes on generation to generation to generation to generation. And then we continue and continue and continue and no one does anything about it. And we're all there self-righteous saying, oh, I'm so great. That one is a manipulative liar, but I'm a saint. Every single one of us has thought of killing someone. Even if it's just like, oh, I'll kill you. <laughs> Every single one of us has thought of stealing. Damn, that looks really good. I wish I had. Every single one of us, because the energy that made up your parents makes you up, makes up your kids, makes up the next generation, etc., 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 and it has not changed forever, and it's not going to change. The mind will not change. It is not changing. We have to change and remember that we are that true being. That is not the mind. But wait, there's more layers. But this is how this is created. Are you dealing with the demons of the past that you may not even know? Your father may have been an alcoholic, a delusional crazy, had you. Now he's sober, he's a saint, he moved into the monastery. And why are you acting like if you don't know this? Is it the thoughts? It's subconscious. This is why it's below. This is only when we quiet the mind when we can go deeper and see the truth. Because all you know of is that conception that your father was an alcoholic, delusional, crazy. So you're still reacting, reacting. None of us act. We react to all of these chittas that are below the surface. We think we're so in tune. Oh, my conscious mind. I'm so smart. I'm so logical and rational. This is the stuff that owns us. This is where we have to change. So how does Ayurveda explain dissociative identity disorder? So dissociative identity disorder is the old, now that's the new name. It's multiple personality disorder. It's exactly that. It's believing that you are different these, but that person actually has observable, distinct traits. But every single one of us has disassociative disorder. I mean, but the, I was reading that it goes very down to the very, like, physiologically, these people change when they change. Like, their eyesight change changes from personal. Like, some of their personalities need glasses and other ones don't. But what did we say yesterday? that show up. But what did we say yesterday? The body is simply a it's gross amazing. manifestation of the mind. mind. But are those, so then are those, <clears throat> every single one of us have, read this guy, Gurdjieff, G-U-R-D-J-I-E-F. -G He's a little out there, <laughs> so you may not understand him, but. He's amazing. And it's not that he said anything new. The stuff I sent you yesterday, Theosophical Society, all based on the Vedas. Yeah. Gurdjieff, all based on the Vedas. Everything's on the Vedas. Yeah. This is just people that have like broken it down and explained certain parts easier to understand. Then you go to the root. 
So just because it's an easier explanation, if we are a million eyes, at every moment you're a different person, we experience this in our family. When I'm with my kids, I'm different than when I'm with my parents. Why? Because with my kids, I'm the adult. With my parents, I'm the little girl. Mm -hmm. We see that in our day-to-day -day thing. At work, professional. you're a professional. At home, give me a mind. I mean, so we see that we are different people with those people because it's a much deeper disorder. They're actually, probably, just like the alcoholic, probably more in their truth than any of us is that they have clear, distinct personalities. Great movie, Three Faces of Eve. Right. True case, Great. phenomenal, and they show how she was healed. Because she went down, which we'll talk about, to the root of what was happening. Mm -hmm. And then she was able to join those eyes and be normal like right. us. But we all have that. So are they each different like has that person lived in each of those lives at a different time like are they from past lives or are they just like everything everything it's fragmentation the way my guidance explains it to me is think of a mirror and, and I'm sure any of you especially if you have an iPhone based with my children tell me that the, the case cracks the mirror cracks it's like that the mirror cracks and you see yourself in the mirror, you know that just because the mirror cracks, you're still whole. Those people look at themselves in the mirror and they see the different cracks as different people. Oh, that's, that's the explanation like that. my guides gave yeah, me. And cool. I thought that was a good visual. Whereas you see yourself as whole. They are seeing these. Each of them. But we are every one of us just like that. That's an amazing movie. I highly recommend it. It's like Amazon two bucks. Three faces of Eve. It's black and white. Three faces of Eve. But amazing. Have you seen Sybil? Oh, Sibyl. years ago. That's another. Yeah, she's another famous case. Three faces of Eve. And so this this is us, and we're constantly going. And so your parents were like that too, and that's why we're all crazy. Okay. There's no room. I have a question. Yes. If we are a, basically a, a product, our mind is a product of our parents, what about their parents? So are we a product of all our ancestors? Yes. All of ours. All of ours. That is all stored scary. in the chittas. In the chittas, look, That's your scary. body knows. Look at genetics. You may have your great grandfather's nose. How did your body know? Your mind knew because you're just dragging. Well, that's and that's not. all we are doing. That is the word. All we are doing, people, is dragging the cross, dragging the bag of garbage. If you're Jewish, you're dragging it across the desert. If you're Christian, you're dragging the cross of Jesus. Every we are dragging it. The minute that we incarnate in this body, the thing is that we're this Atman, we're this Purusha, we're this chocolate chip cookie dough that's immense. The minute that we take on a physical body, we'll talk about the other two bodies because there's layers to that that don't really die, we are enslaved. Immediately, this is a prison. Because how do you contain something that has no limits in a body? That's why every single person feels unfulfilled. Mm -hmm. If you are the Atman, if you are God himself, and now all of a sudden you are told all you can live in is this little body, you're going to want to, I know I do, I can't stand yeah. this thing. That's why I love being in, 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 in my intuitive world. Because it's like when we close off the senses. Oh my God, my true self emerges. Oh my God, I'm I'm not in this thing, and I get to breathe. That's that's for me my saving grace. If not, I would. This thing just bothers me. That's why we're also unfulfilled. That's where the senses are like get more, get more, get more, get more, and we see it in people. We see it with your example from yesterday. Your twenties, you can't understand that. Like me with the breastfeeding and the thing, and I'm doing 15 things, and you're like, oh my god, at 20s I did everything. Because we don't have it 
to understand that that's not the truth. As we get older, you hope, you get closer and closer and closer to the truth. That's why with the four stages of life, what happens moksha, the whole purpose of, of living in an ashram was you would go and visit and give money. So that in your older years, when you were ready to resign everything and relinquish all your goods, now you had paid into the ashram, and they're going to take care of you and feed you, and, and you're going to live the days of your life working on your liberation. It was a perfect system. Right? It's like the crappy retirement system we have here, but here it's based on money. In India, and that's all mythology, it's amazing how that came to be. Hello, let's give a people a place where once they've attained, met all their desires, now they can let it go and go dedicate themselves. That's why as we get older, it's the natural progression. Things are shifting, things are changing. So many of us at a younger age are realizing things, but there is still natural progression because this world is ruled by time. But that world, which it really isn't there, it's here, but as we mostly can associate it, doesn't have a time. That's why when we do spiritual activities that can get us out of this, we feel so good. You feel like, oh my God, I was escaping my prison and connecting back with my true self. And that's what we're here to do. But we are all dragging the crap of our parents, of our own past lives, samskara chitta. This is where the past life stuff is stored. And when you go to a regression, this is where you go to. When you do hypnosis, this is where you go to. You go to this chitta part, okay? And all we're doing is traveling with the crap of our parents and our grandparents. And you can see all of this in the chart, in the astrology chart. I can tell you everything that the grandmother on your father's side thought of whatever it is that shows up on your chart because that's what you came in this one to track. So we are being loyal. We have what are called loyalties to these people of 20 million generations ago that we never even knew. And they're still owning us. They're phantoms that never leave. I mean, we're dealing with a lot of stuff. And the only way to get out of that is to recognize our true nature. And that's what we're all here to do. And usually that comes later in life, once we've obtained all of the karma, you know, we've gone through our, I got the house, I got the car, I got the job, I got, and then it's like, oh my God, I'm not fulfilled. I got three, and they're pretty young guys at this moment, right now in my practice, in this stage. They've got everything. I'm so not fulfilled. It doesn't matter how much money I have, how much I can trip, travel, how much sex I have. Help me. And this is the stuff I'm doing <coughs> at 33 years old. Mm -hmm. So people are realizing younger and younger and younger. The age of Aquarius is really bringing that. The Kali Yuga. Like maybe I just felt like stagnant for the last couple of years. And it's, it's funny because they tell um, in my immediate family, like I was the first one to buy a house. Like I'm at house at 24, you know? And I was like, wow, it was a goal set, you know, that I, I put out and I did. And then the children and then the job and I'm like, hmm, something's missing. I don't know what it is. And I was telling you, like I felt more spiritual in my 20s than I do now. I don't know. I I've, I've been around a couple of religions. I've got into a couple of religions like um, Jehovah Witness. I was a, a Muslim for very many years. Like very hardcore here, salas, five times, seven times a day sometimes. You know, no pork and like really into it. And um, I got into it mainly because I really like the discipline. But then after a while I was like, nah, you know? So it's like in my teens, my late teens and my 20s, it's like, oh yeah, all these religions that I've experienced, and it's like nothing. So it's like yeah. when people come talk to me about religion and they're like trying to like convince me, this is the religion that is, I'm like, the only thing there, the only Do you think that you said that you're more spiritual when you're in your 20s? I think that maybe you were more religious in your 20s, but maybe you're more spiritual now. 
because you have that openness now, and that's what comes with spirituality. Religion is very, very rigid. Right. You know, you know what it is. Is I was, I've always been open. Um, although when I was Muslim, I kind of closed myself down because, unfortunately, in that type of religion and culture, women are very suppressed. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm not gonna lie. I kind of like built walls around people and like kind of not but communicate to with people. When I was Muslim. When you hear yourself saying, I, that's the ego. That's why it's called the i -ness. And of course you have to build walls because it's the ego is dictating that. Does the spirit have any I? Does the spirit have a religion? Mm -hmm. So go ahead. Yeah, so it's like I built those walls and I felt like if I lost a lot of communication, a lot of friends, like I go back and I'm like, well, what, what did I do in my 20s? Like I was just by myself, like working, working, working like, I'm, like a maniac because that's how I get focused on work, two and three jobs, sometimes even four, being pregnant, I was back, you know? And then after I left, it was like a weight lifted off, and then it's like openness, and I'm like, damn, I miss so much, you know? I run into people that I've known for 20 years, I'm like, man, we lived down the street this whole time, I've talked to you on and off, but I, I really don't know anything about your life. Well. When we're seeking, all of that is imposed on, and it's all stored in the chittas, by our family, by our values. You haven't missed anything. If we understand, going back to the image of collaborative, that every single thing that happens to us is the path, that was what you had to endure. That is what your soul chose to experience through this tool that it was given. And so when you say, I miss so much, that's a judgment, that's an ego. We have to start listening to what we say. We have to start listening to the words that we're putting out there. So who cares how much we bless our water if what we're saying out in everything is against us? You miss nothing. You absolutely, trust me, you're going to miss anything. You have so many lifetimes and so many more to go. And you're going to miss nothing. You're going to meet those people over and over and over again. I know, I, I, I say this so we can laugh about it, but it, it's what's dictating us. It's, it's the enslavement that we're in. That was your path. You had to experience that. I went through a similar thing. My kids were reminding me that the other day. I was dragging him to church and juice for Jesus. And, and mom, do you remember this one time I went to the Messianic temple? Three freaking hours. I wanted to vomit. Like, I was going to stay there. And after three hours, this thing didn't stop. And this person next to me goes, oh, this goes on for hours. And I was like, oh, hell no. And I took my kids. And my kids remember that. I was so lost. I was so lost because what I was brought up in, I left. Lost as can be. And so we're on this spirit. Quest. We're seeking, we're in a quest because we're looking for the truth. And we know, you knew that that wasn't the truth. And it, for some people, that works. For some people, it's beautiful. That's not for me. Everybody has their own experience based on our previous samskaras. Right. So what you had to experience, you had to experience. Maybe there was some unfinished business in a Muslim faith from the past. Maybe you killed someone that was Muslim or you mistreated him and you had to come experience the suppression. Maybe you were the man. I mean, we can access this. This is what I do for a living. I know we can access this. But if we understand that everything is purposeful, do you think God has made anything that isn't purposeful? I don't. Every single thing has a purpose. There's not a second. If we go back to living in the present moment, if you just observe nature, every second is purposeful. We're the ones that have assumed that it's not. Oh, this doesn't matter. I can't wait till I'm retired. Get me out of this courthouse. <laughs> right? I know. I know. I have to go back to my old job two days this week. It's like, oh. Like, How am I going to bring God into that? And I'm like, oh, kill me. I have two I, days I, to I, 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 I now <laughs> strongly believe that I'm there for a higher. Of course, to bring uh, your light, to bring your beauty, to. A higher reason. 
of service. Of service. Of service. So when we go in bringing God, 